this week on the Grassroots Podcast. Um, and what it really came down to for me was like, are you really having fun with this anymore? And then you look at the sheet and you're cut. Hmm. And it's rough. And see, and like it's just like like ah, like that moment right there, my my heart just sunk. It, it helps you grow as a person because you can find out what you really want to be um, in life and later in life when you're not just dependent on one that one aspect of your life to define you as a human being. Hi, I'm JFK, and I'm Quincy, and this is the Grassroots Podcast brought to you by NSA and Thought Fox Media. John, we're, we're in the studio. We are in the, the, Fox, Fo- Den. the, the Fox Den. The Fox Den. The place to be when you want to record a podcast. Mm, that crystal clear quality. Ah, uh, beautiful display. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. He is the engineer of audio engineering. So, Q. Yes. Take us through this. We're, we're, what's going on in the world today? Um, outside of what's going on in America, uh, I, don't, I don't know, actually. There's, there's a lot going on. Well, let's stick away from that. But we'll stick away from the drama going on. You know, how about we talk about what, what's going on with, with what I do? I don't like to mm. put the mic in my hand, but yeah. I'll just grab it and I'll take it. You're not conceited at all. So no, not at all. Give it to you. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about the AIHL. For those yes. of you who don't know, uh, I play for the North Stars the Newcastle North Stars of the AIHL team. It's an ice hockey league. I would say it's kind of like semi-pro. It's not semi-pro because we don't get paid, mm. allegedly. But, uh, you know, uh, it, it's great for players overseas in North America because some of our North American viewers, a lot of us call it, we've said that it's a glorified men's league, yep. which uh, it kind of is, but it isn't. It's really good. It's very organized. It's a lot of fun. Each team's allowed to have four imports from anywhere, whether that's North America or if it's Europe or... I haven't seen any UK players. No, mm. but no, I mean, yeah, but there are UK players. I was thinking like Russian. Russian. I, you know, Michael, have you seen any Russian players? There has been yes. Russian. Okay, we need Michael some more. He's okay, there have been Russian players. But uh, no, it's, uh, it's a 28 game season. It's, since we're in the Southern Hemisphere, it's during everyone else's summer, which yep. is our winter. So players are allowed to do this in their off season. Mm. But uh, sure as of feels. now, uh, we're past the halfway point. Um, it's starting to get to the nitty gritty. Uh, yes. There's eight teams. Two in Sydney, two in Melbourne. Mm. I said Melbourne, not Melbourne. Melbourne. I've been here long enough in Australia, so I'm not going to make that mistake. Uh, Also, Canberra has a team, the capital city. Not Canberra, once again. Uh, Perth, Adelaide, and that is it. Those are our eight teams. That's the rundown. That's the rundown. But, uh, yeah, so it's getting down to the home stretch. Mm. Um, Top four teams make it to the final weekend. One, One versus four, two versus three, and anything can happen there. So, I mean, we're, we're midway in the ladder. We're third on the ladder. Things that we've had our ups and downs. Impressive. We've won it last year. No big deal. Took it um, Good all cup championships. Yep. Yeah. Number one. Yep. And mm. you know what? Uh, to be honest, when it comes down to... Like, no, I can't tell you that. So, all I got to say is the good all cup. No, the good all <laughs> cup, like winning it was... It, as as small as it may seem, it was amazing. Oh, Absolutely amazing. I bet it was. We I mean, won winning it. a championship. It's, it's, it's always, always good. good. But we won it over time with a penalty shot. Mm. Doesn't Ooh. get more dramatic than that. that Doesn't get shot. more dramatic. Really <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. shout out to Brian Bells for burying that puck. Mm. Um, he is quite the sniper in more ways than one. And, uh, yeah. So, Absolutely. Yeah, that's really good. So, um, yeah. Q, um, about this podcast. Where, what's our topic today? What are we going to be discussing? What are we diving into? Absolutely. So today we are talking about uh, when athletes put down their sport. When do athletes step out and what that looks like in regards to uh, their day-to-day, uh, after sports, uh, the decision going into it, in addition to their health afterwards, which we will be bringing in our friend, Chase. Yes, Jace. He is amazing. Enliven nutrition. He mm-hmm. gives you all the nuggets that you need to be healthy on Not it. chicken nuggets. <laughs> Stays away from the, the gold nuggets. nuggets. I hear the told wisdom, you. the knowledge the bombs. wisdom nuggets. But uh, you know what? This is uh, one of those topics that uh, it, it touches my heart uh, mm. because uh, I've because now that I've made that commitment of staying here in Australia and playing here in the IHL, um, I had to set down that goal and dream of playing in the NHL. And I'm not gonna lie, people are. Oh my gosh, John! I've known John. I've seen him play. There was no way he was gonna make it to the NHL. But Actually, I, I was surprised. You were surprised. I was surprised you didn't. See, here's the thing. I always saw myself winning a Stanley Cup before mm. I even thought about the NHL. Like I just, I always had a picture in my mind. I'm like, I'm gonna win a Stanley Cup. Like, gonna raise but, it. Yeah, it's just like, how are you gonna get there? I don't back know. To my hometown. <laughs> but I, I, along with 99.99 percent of any <laughs> athletic population 
had had that dream, mm. and I I think it's healthy to have I that dream. dream. Yeah. <laughs> By MLK, <laughs> MLK. <laughs> but it, it's healthy to have that dream. It's healthy to pursue something. I don't yes. think anything great in life has ever came from small dreams. Absolutely. And it was something that I was pursuing, I was chasing, but then it did come down to that moment where I had to make that decision. Where I'm like, mm. essentially, I'm not going to pursue something that I've been chasing since. I was a kid, you know, when you first put on skates, you're imagining you're playing game seven in the Stanley Cup finals. No one ever imagines themselves playing a rec league game and scoring the third goal. Like, you, no, it's like, yeah, right. you always imagine yourself game seven. I didn't uh, imagine myself sitting on the bench. Yeah, I didn't imagine myself sitting on the bench. <laughs> so, I mean, I remember that, that moment. Mm. It was, it's very vivid in my mind where I made that decision. I remember it was a, a long discussion with mom and dad. And they, they put it to me, like, and I applaud my parents for allowing me to step away. But mm-hmm. I'll get into more details with that. Uh, discussing this topic as well, we have Max. Uh, Max is from my alma mater, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI. Uh, we'll probably have more guests from RPI because it's a great school. We love it. Uh, the engineers, Rock the red. <laughs> Rock the cherry red. red and white. Um, yes, our mascot is engineers. Uh, Founded in 1824, the first engineering school in an English-speaking language. Um, you guys aren't going to hear enough about RPI because I love it. I bleed cherry red and white. But uh, really? Max, he uh, just graduated this year. Did uh, played lacrosse for them. Uh, played lacrosse for the men's team, obviously. The men's team, yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yes, but uh, Max, can you fill in some gaps for our listeners? Yeah, so I played lacrosse since I was what five or six years old in the backyard, starting the backyard with my dad. Just like anyone starts any sport, you know? Yeah. Um, then I moved on, played some youth league, and then moved through high school. Had a great high school career with all my buddies back home. And then was recruited to RPI, which is Division Three for lacrosse, not uh, Division One like hockey. Played for two years and then decided to hang up the cleats and um, enjoy the student life and the civilian life, as they say. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk about that. So uh, why did you hang up the cleats? Uh, well, for me, it was a tough decision, as I'm sure, John, yeah. it was for you. Um, I had to talk with my parents as well. It was kind of, it was one of those things. So, you know, when you go home, you always talk with your dad. You're like, oh, what's the first thing you talk about? It's always your sport. Mm-hmm. It's always like, oh, how's lacrosse going? And like, how's the, then you talk about different teams, whether it's different colleges, stuff like that. So I talked with my mom and was like, oh, how would dad feel about this? But she was like, you know, it's your decision. Um, and what it really came down to for me was like, are you really having fun with this anymore? Like when you play a sport growing up, it's always like, I'm having fun. I'm with my buddies. I'm really enjoying my time out there practicing, playing, and it just wasn't fun anymore. So uh, when it's causing you more stress than it's worth, it just kind of becomes a point where you're like, I feel like my time could be better spent either studying or finding another activity, whether it's a hobby or something like that, really take advantage of my time. Mm -hmm. Could you break that down a bit? So what was the stress? I mean, how do you go from loving it, um, like you said, being there with your maids, playing, and really being who you, like kind of your identity and going to this is stressing me out I don't want to play anymore like what's that transition look like uh so it starts it starts slow you don't really really realize it at first but for me I was always a kid who really enjoyed practice lacrosse practice was always the highlight of my day whether it was high school or college um you really look forward to it and even if I was having a tough day in school or studying or had a bad test I would be like oh I got lacrosse practice at the end of the day and so my sophomore year of college um, I'd always I'd start to be like later and later out of the locker room starting out freshman in high school I was always the first guy out on the field. I was ready to go very excited But then um, coming into sophomore year the spring season. It was super cold that year We had plenty of snow the field was mm-hmm. always covered and it just it became more and more, more yeah, of a burden yeah. honestly mm-hmm. um, and so I started getting out there later and later and later and then so we have fall ball junior year which is like our off season but we still have practices and it's, I just I'd go into practice and be like, I would not look forward to it at all. And I'd kind of like almost resent it. I'd be like the one of the last people out of the locker room. And so when I kind of looked into my heart, I realized, look, this isn't who I want to be on a lacrosse field. It's not representing what I really work for, the kind of player I want to be. And so it, it's just, it's not the place that I want to be on the lacrosse field isn't some isn't the person I'm being out there so yeah, it's, you know, I realize that good. and when he touched it on the heart I think that has a huge thing I had and I guess there was before I did make that decision there was another opportunity or another time where I almost made that decision again and that was after playing two years of juniors I was in Cleveland I remember this. uh played with uh, the North American Hockey League um with the Cleveland Barons and um we had a had a great season um we ended up going to nationals that year um 
and then our team was going from the NAHL to the USHL. And being one of the best defensemen on the team, I, like did great in trials when we were making this transition. And when we're talking about USHL, like that is the league to be in. If you play regular shifts in there, you're going to get your sc- college scholarship. And that's all I wanted. I wanted to play college hockey. I knew that. I wanted to get my education. We play Div 1 and go from there. And like I've put in the time, effort, the years, like the hard yards. Well, after being on Cleveland and then going to these tryouts, you make it to the last, the final game, the all-star game. And then you look at the sheet and you're cut. Hmm. And it's rough. And see, and like it's just like like ah, like that moment right there, my my heart just sunk. It's just like so. And then like I, it doesn't even help when people tell you like, oh, you should have made it. Like, I can't believe you didn't make. It's not like there's any moral victory to it. <laughs> it, it just, like it's not like oh, well, if you said that, I should have made it. So oh, I feel <laughs> great. Like I was just wrecked. Hmm. And it was because I've poured so much into the game. I poured so much of my heart into it. Like my time, effort, um, the drives, like mom and dad driving me uh, like all the way, an hour and a half, one way for practice. And then for that to happen. So I was at the moment where I was so disappointed. I'm just like, I've poured so much into the sport and it hasn't given, the return wasn't there. And I was getting ready to hang the skates up then. Absolutely. Uh, Go yeah. Ahead. So okay. Yeah. So yeah. Good. I was gonna say, Max, you mentioned uh, that you had had that talk with your parents, and you were saying like, usually when you go home, it's like a oh, house across. So when you had that conversation with your parents, what did they say? Um, they were pretty supportive of me. That was that was like I feel like most most people worry about how their parents are gonna react, and when I talk to other kids who are kind of thinking about um, stopping playing lacrosse, especially at RPI, because it's a pretty stressful environment. It's not a great retention rate for the program there, but um, I mean, great great program either way. But so a lot of kids kind of, those thoughts go through their mind. And so when I've talked to them, it's, they've always been like, well, I don't want to disappoint my dad or I don't want to disappoint my mom. Yeah. The person who's always brought them there, kind of the same thing you were saying, John. Yeah. Um, most of the people's parents end up saying, look, I didn't do that for for myself. I did it for you. And so if this doesn't bring you joy anymore, if this isn't what you want, then I trust your your decision. Like you don't need to be there if, if it's not bringing joy to you. It's kind of like the same thing you said, John. Like when you at D1, you have scholarships, but for Division three athletes, it's kind of, you're out there grinding. You don't get any scholarship. You are you put in all the work and it's just kind of for yourself. You got to find that drive within yourself. And so that's kind of when you lose that, it's you're just kind of wasting your time. You're wasting your time and then you're wasting your teammates' time a little bit mm-hmm. when you're not there fully in practice and you're not helping your team get better just because you're not energized to be there. Yeah. And so part of it was these guys are my best friends. I don't want to take away from them. I don't want to take the spot of someone who really deserves to be there and wants to be there more than I do. And I see a lot of maturity in that. I see a lot of maturity in that decision. And I think you have to be real with yourself and you have to have enough emotional intelligence, but you have to have enough self-awareness. Absolutely. of who you are in order to make that decision. Well, the, the big thing that was a struggle for me was so, I'm sure growing up for you guys, like your sport's your identity. When you're going through high school or, or whatever it is, you're like, oh, I'm a lacrosse player. I'm on this team. This yeah. is who I am. Yeah. And so that's definitely, I'd say, one of the biggest struggles after quitting a sport is kind of like re-identifying yourself as a person. And it's, it's kind of something that's like very healthy for people to go to. And eventually everybody has to go through that, mm-hmm. whether it's earlier in life or later. You got to figure out who you are as a person and really say like, Oh, I'm not just this kid who plays the lacrosse. You got to find your other interests, whether it's hanging out with your friends, playing video games, or for me, it was going skiing. I love doing that since I lived up in uh, the Northeast. But you got to, it, it helps you grow as a person because you can find out what you really want to be um, in life and later in life when you're not just dependent on one that one aspect of your life to define you as a human being. So, yeah, wow. Dropping bombs on the grassroots uh, podcast. That's so, right. I, so, how was that transition when it comes down to like, like you said, your friends, your teammates? How did they handle it? Um, yeah, take us there. Well, so for for me, I lived with a bunch of guys who played lacrosse. They're still I lived with them afterwards. Um, they kind of knew it was coming a little bit. It wasn't. I kind of, I went up and did it myself, and then I told them, "Hey guys, like I'm off the team. I'm out, I'm done with it." But it's this, your friends are the same as your parents. They're not going to change just because you're not playing. You're not in the club anymore. Mm-hmm. Plus, by the time I did it, it everybody was kind of old enough where you, it wasn't like, "Oh, you're only cool if you're on this team." Yeah, right. um, so I lived with them. I was still around them. They're still my best friends in the entire world. They were never not supportive of me. They're like, "Look, dude, if you're if you want to be happy doing something else, then." like it's it's your life it's more power to you the hardest thing is kind of filling that time I'd say so I lived with six other guys um, five or more on the lacrosse team so the house was pretty empty 
during lacrosse practice time, so they had lift and then practice. So it was pretty much five hours a day where they were up at the stadium or um, on the field putting their work in. And so when you're empty like that, you got to find something else to do. And so um, during the day, you, you most of the time, I feel like a lot of people take up like a hobby. I like I learned how to cook, um, and I do things around the house, whether it was reading or writing or. I wasn't big into studying as much. Yeah. I mean, engineering, <laughs> engineering books aren't that interesting. Yeah, no, but uh, Great. but Great. you got to be able to fill that time, and that's kind of where that whole like you learn how you become who you are as a person is when there's the silence around you and there's nothing else to fill it, mm. and you kind of have to really look into yourself and find um, really your, what really you want to be as a person when you have to redefine yourself and there's just that the the silence. Yeah, mm. so good. But so for some of our younger audience, Quincy, I remember you started playing hockey. Mm. And at what age did you put that down and you kind of pursued football? Yeah, so actually really young age. So you would know this better than me. Uh, I did squirts. So my Pee-wee? first year of Pee Wee. Okay. So whatever age that would be uh, is when I got out of it. Uh, with that being said, um, I did start focusing more on, on football at gridiron. Uh, but I would also say that I wish I wouldn't have quit that early. Okay. I don't think I made an educated uh, decision. I remember uh, dad calling me one day. He was like, hey, I'm getting ready to sign up, you know, sign you up for hockey. Like, do you want to do it? He's like, no pressure either way. And I kind of, as he said that, I think the fact that he was asking me if I wanted to play, I felt pressured to not play. Oh, okay. And so, like I, like, I said no. But I said no because I had a choice. But I really wish I didn't, hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, because at that age, I really didn't know. And my friends were still playing. And I remember how cool it was in elementary school. Um, like you had your guys that you played because it was like a township league yeah so you guys all play house league together and they're coming to school and they're all talking about like the practices afterwards and they're all wearing their jerseys to school and you know being little kids and talking about you know practice and stuff and i remember like i started to miss out on that and i quickly just kind of got out of it and i kind of wish i didn't you know and see that's the thing about sports it's the camaraderie about it Mm -hmm. i don't think i don't think anything really compares to it Um, just being in the locker room with your teammates, like I have close friends, but at the same time, like how I was with my teammates doesn't compare. Like I know my classmates, for example, and like you stayed with your classmates as well and you lived with them, but my classmates, even though like like, talking terms, we, some of us talk, we don't talk, would have done anything for them. Yeah. Absolutely would have done anything for those guys in the locker room. I would have like giving my left arm for the team I, I it wouldn't have been a question about it I think you actually did that before didn't uh, you kind of it's a legendary story yes yeah. I did take a slap shot mm. shattered my hand yeah. for the team for the team for the and then and then I stayed back out there and I took another shot it's for the boys for the boys for the, you the, for the right? cup I heard it's for the cup see, <laughs> see, <laughs> see, 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 see that's the worst part about it that game it was against our biggest rival union oh see if there's if there's any I don't know if there's a bigger hockey rival like people hear about Michigan Michigan State you hear about U of M Ohio State I I don't know any like SEC like all I I don't know you have Auburn Alabama Auburn Alabama yes RPI versus Union. If you guys, it's an old you, school rivalry. <laughs> so, for the shoes, yeah. <laughs> for the shoes, you guys are for, 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 for the shoes. But any, yeah. So that no, that game, no, we did not win it. Mm. Mm. I know, mm. but I would still do it over. This I is would the game do... that the coaches get into fights after the game. It's <laughs> a is, true story. It is true. The coaches true. get out on the ice and get into fights. Uh, allegedly, you can see this on YouTube. I wouldn't. Do it, but if you not quoting um, the URL, yeah, not quoting the URL, but if you were Check to go to, if you were to happen to put in the sequence RPI Union and fight into YouTube, you may see something. Uh, some I don't know. Older <laughs> gentlemen fight. They definitely weren't skating around there. That's all. I know. But back to the topic I had. Mm. So now I'm going to go to my story of when I quit the dream. I'm still playing hockey, like I said, because obviously I'm so passionate about the sport. But when I actually made that decision to step away completely, and it was after, so I went through my four years of college. Best four years of my life. And then, okay, you know what? I'm going to just take you down memory lane. So, my <laughs> senior... Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride. I feel like, I feel like we, should, ride we should put it like in black and white. Okay. Oh, transition. So, so, I'm going to try to take you through this as best as possible. But my senior year, we had an incredible class. We did very well. But in playoffs, we ended up losing first round. Or we lost, Yeah, I think we lost first round in game three. So, it's a three-game series, best of three. We lost in a three-game series. And I, like, it was an OT, mm. overtime. And I was, like, from the bench, I was looking, and I saw the gap, and, like, the guy shot it, and bam, four years. Like, my, it was just, I never, like, mm. I'm trying to think if I've ever cried as hard as that. Like, I'm, 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 I'm a man. I have emotions. Mm. You, know, you know, sometimes, you know, I'm kind of like a, you know, 
a little John Ocean moment, you know, very mm-hmm. emotional. But um, in the locker room, I remember it's just just bawling my eyes out. But we did so well that we were able to make the national tournament that year, which was pretty sweet. But I just remember that just disappointing moment. But after college, I ended up doing a year of semi-pro for uh, the Dayton Gems, no longer uh, a team anymore. Uh, shout out to Daytona. But uh, after that, we ended up. I ended up finding out that there was a league in Australia. So I'm like, sweet, I'll check that out in my off season. Go down to Australia. They take care of my flights and accommodation. Have fun. If you guys haven't out there, any hockey players that are playing, check it out. It's a great league. It's a lot of fun. Mm. So I play. I go down to Canberra, play a season, have fun, blah blah blah, blah this and that. Um, after playing a year of semi pro, where you're getting three hundred, three to four hundred dollars a week, um, it's a grind. Um, you're expected to go out there and like get in fights and do this. It's a grind, and this was double A hockey. So you have single A, double A, triple A, triple A being AHL, and then you have the show. So if you're trying to get to the NHL, you got to go through AHL, which some people say is harder because these are all the guys trying to get there. They're one step away, so it's very competitive. And then below that, you have double A, and you ha- at that time you had an East Coast League and Central. I would say East Coast was a little bit higher ranked than East Central. So you have a slightly taller tier there. Then you have SPHL. Mm. So pretty much it, I was right here and I had to climb this ladder. And then after, you know, coming to Australia, the only thing I had that year, it was a year of the NHL lockout. So you yeah, had the trickle that. down effect. So guys that were in the NHL were playing AHL. Guys that were in the AHL pushed down to double A hockey. Right. And then those guys were pushed down to single A. So all I had was a single A contract. Mm. So I so, so the thing about it, I went from like okay three to four hundred. I'm like this is a grind. To all right now it could be two to three hundred dollars, and it's even more of a grind. And I made the mistake of getting a like a big person job, and I was pulling checks. Oh, you know, that's that, nice. That's oh, it's nice. It's <laughs> nice to be able to look at your bank account and be able to be like, I can buy that. Mm. It's, it's nice to be able to like have that flexibility and use the degree, as they say. Use the degree, and see that's the reason why. And like I always knew there was going to be life after hockey. Mm. There's always life after sports, like Max said, and I knew that was happening. And then it was just I was so conflicted in my heart. It's just like man, it's just. Do I get the career started? Because I know I'm not. It's just everything happened all at once. I knew I wasn't going to make a living off of a minor pro contract. I saw the other side. And I'm like, I was 25 years old. I'm not technically. I'm still. I was still young, but from a hockey point of view, you're still getting a little bit older. Yeah. And so that's when I had to make that decision. And I remember once again talked to mom and dad, had that discussion. Um, but like I said, the big thing for me, like you said earlier, which resonated with me, was the heart yeah was it in my heart to be able to grind it out day in day out to go to practice to know what's ahead of you to be willing to travel get traded from a team from here across the nation or there to here was i willing to do that and Mm -hmm. i knew deep down inside it wasn't there yeah it went from being able to take a bullet from my teammates to I didn't want to get off the ice want to before be, your teammates. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> go ahead. That's the thing with high level sports too. Like I'm sure any any professional athlete, college athlete, will tell you if you're not fully invested, you're either going to get hurt or you're not. Yeah. You're, you're not going to have fun and you're going to hurt your team. Absolutely. So I totally I totally understand where you're coming from. Where if you're not fully invested and you're not out there grinding and working your hardest every day. You're going to get hurt or your team's going to suffer. And you don't want to do that to your boys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You were mentioning uh, a second ago, John, about life after. And you were mentioning about how you find your identity in your sport and then what that looks like after your sport. Um, before we get into uh, better than yesterday, let's kind of talk about uh, your life after uh, lacrosse. And are you still in that pursuit of finding your identity or what that looks like? Uh, so for me, it's it's been, like I said, a lot of kind of like – dealing with that the silence and so you find hobbies whether it's cooking i've been going skiing a lot um or just kind of reconnecting with other people finding other things to do you just fill the time um reading and so it's kind of you kind of got to grow up a little bit find other things to do as as an adult as i'm sure anyone does to fill their time when they're not just surrounded by their friends or they don't have five hours a day that's planned out for them Mm, that's right well since we're talking about life after sports uh, a big thing that we need to talk about is nutrition after sports. Absolutely. So, yeah. what better time than better than yesterday? Oh, here we're inviting go. our boy Jace up here. Jace, can we, can we give a little clap? Yes. 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 Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, tell us, 
what should we be doing after we're uh, done with our sport and we have to live everyday life, work the nine to five, the hustle, the grind. How should we be eating? What's our diet look like? Uh, a lot less generally. Um, mm. Many people, I suppose, with a lot of physical activity in terms of your training and the on-field loading as well is called appetite responders. So you get that appetite to eat more and more food. Mm. So the idea for general population of what a portion size would be just gets inflated. And the thing is, because you're burning so much petrol at the end of the day, yep. you get away with it. You need that petrol. But to, to stop that and, and then to go away from that and then to go back to normal every day-to-day life where food is something that you know, it can be quite comforting as well, mm. and it's consistent. So you have a bad day, you can go back to food and you know what you're going to get. Um, the problem is, but you're going to inadvertently put too much petrol in the tank and we're way too efficient at holding on to that at the end of the day. And yeah, you see that a lot. So many times when you see uh, retired athletes mm. a year or two and they just swell up. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Like the, the ballooning or the <laughs> up and down. <laughs> you got to kind of like, so yeah, absolutely. When you quit, when you retire or whatever, you're used to eating so much, but then when you kind of got to figure out how your body reacts to whether you're weightlifting or whatever exercise you're doing, you got to kind of tone it down and figure out what works for you. Definitely. Mm. Absolutely. Not, In in regards to that, uh, you hear a lot right now. There's so many different diets. There's so many different workouts uh, for athletes nowadays. Uh, I guess, is there a specific diet that someone should be on right after uh, they get done with a sport? Or should they just try it, test it, and see what their body does? I think everyone feels better on on different things. And everyone will know their body. And and whenever I see someone on an individual basis, that's that's the one thing. I can give you the information, but you're the expert on yourself. Mm -hmm. Um... So knowing that first and foremost is crucial to know which way you want to go, uh, but making sure things are balanced as well. So if you do see someone in a, in a professional capacity, they can make sure that that is balanced nutritionally for you. So you're, you're getting your vitamins, your minerals, you're getting your requirements. Um, whether you want to be vegetarian, vegan, paleo, um, there's ways and means around that and you can make that adequate, uh, even halal if there's a religious belief behind it as well that cultural belief um it can be structured around it as well there's no right or wrong way uh but but there's definitely uh just the sheer volume of food which is like i guess what i'm hearing from you is kind of experiment see what works with you personally and go from there and how big or how important is it to find an active hobby after sports absolutely and i think like that notion of better than yesterday as well I always drive as one of the support elements in a network for people for athletes transitioning away mm-hmm. um why not channel that into some sort of physical activity and you can still have that element of progression and, and working to be better than what you were yesterday at that activity to improve your, your health your fitness uh your strength and conditioning mm-hmm. um and even for general health we know that your strength levels will determine your longevity in, in later in life mm. and your independence. So it's a fantastic thing to work on just for general health and to take up as a hobby as well. Um, lifting heavy things is always, yeah. Yeah, generally, yeah. generally yeah. for always guys, fun. Always, yeah. fun. <laughs> always fun. It's, it's one of those things. Uh, so, you know, throwing it into, into that side of things and making yourself better that way and mm. the sheer benefits psychologically of exercise as well, you know. No, see, help. I'm not proud to say this, but over the summer... Well, you know what? I am proud. Shout out to Andre. Andre's gym, Bennett's Green. Amazing place. <laughs> but Andre's gym has a word in front of it. CrossFit. So I do some CrossFit. And see, that's the thing. You know what? Like, the thing, CrossFit has blown up. And there's a stigma about it because you have so many people, the way they, they train, the way they throw weights. And some people are like, that is not healthy. And then other people are like... Or the way what? they just talk about it all the time. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But... True. But the thing about it, like the way he works it, like Andre, the their program is amazing. It's definitely teaching you the right and proper way to do it. But when I look at any CrossFit workout, that takes me back to my college training days. Like we didn't call it CrossFit. We just called it working out. Yeah. So I know. So like personally, some athletes that have been pushed so hard in their sport find it difficult to go back to the gym because they're like, no, I was forced to do that. And it always sends like a negative response to their mind. For if you're, have you ever ran into that? And if so, how can you, I guess, embrace life after a sport, but doing something physically that's going to be appealing to an ex-athlete? Absolutely. It, it is taking that shine and that drive off it because you had a very specific focus when you were training for your sport. Yeah. Um, 
set some different goals and use that smart goal format. And you have to be specific. It's got to be measurable. Having all of those different elements to that smart goal format at the end of the day will make sure that it's something that you can achieve. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. But make it very much directed away from your sport. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it might well be you were doing some Olympic lifting when you were training. Um, you actually quite enjoyed it, but, you know, your technique was absolutely terrible. Mm. You know, find a good coach, tighten up that technique. It, it's another element of training, yeah. and, and there's a lot to those things as well to learn. But, it, you know, even if it's not training, it might be something in another type of a sport that's more of a leisure-based thing. And, and movement is what we're designed to do at the end yeah. of the day. Um, sitting down um, is the biggest problem, really, of what we do <laughs> most of the time. There's too much of it. Mm. Yeah. So is there anything that you would recommend in regards to the kind of fitness that's happening? Because I know like there's a lot of like at home fitness for like stay at home moms or people who can't get to the gym. Are those, I guess, as useful as going to the gym or is it anything? Absolutely. And it's about being creative with it as well. Mm. Uh, there's so many online programs that you can access for free now that will give you a, a good workout really. And like for people that aren't as mobile and don't have that fitness base, if you can just start walking. Right, yeah. literally. And that progression, if you can only walk for 10 minutes, then so be it. But if you can do 10 minutes three times a day, there's half an hour. Mm-hmm. Exercise is cumulative. It, it will add up. So those health benefits will add up along with it. And, and use that progression. Use that progressive overload principle. Next time, I want to do more. I want to be better than yesterday. Yeah. Not to use exactly. the pun again. <laughs> um, and, and that's Good the way point. to keep going forward. So, Max, how have you adapted to that? Uh, have you found that thing that you like to do now or is it more kind of just oh absolutely so for me i've always loved weightlifting okay. um so it was kind of it adapted from just continuing on whatever program we were doing from sports whether i get it from my roommates or whatever and then i met a couple guys at the gym who would go there the same time as i was and um, i actually met the new strength coach at rpi who was kind of a younger guy and he'd mm-hmm. be like oh let me exp- like if you were willing to let me experiment so i've been sh- shifting between powerlifting programs or crossfit programs or bodybuilding programs but it's for me it's always been weightlifting and it's just kind of um same thing you said with your motivation you've got to shift from doing it for the team and for the goal to doing it for yourself and that's kind of what i found is the most most important thing for people who who make the excuse of oh i don't have enough time in my days they're not doing it for themselves they usually have some other goal in mind whether they're doing it for a girlfriend or try to get try to whatever try (laughs) to learn or whatever (laughs) but um i found the best way to motivate yourself is definitely just try to do it for yourself yeah um focus on your own health your your own personal gains and so that's what it's always been for me Mm, absolutely it seems like health now is like it's a trend Oh, okay, I'm curious to see how, how long this trend goes or is it just something that like as a society of, of the world that we just want to be healthier I, I say it's probably because of the spotlight the spotlight of social media because everything you put out there everyone sees like even what TV like TVs HD I remember one time I saw like no nothing against him Jay Leno mm. and like I've been watching him on like standard TV for a long time then I saw him on HD I was like oh wow so I'm wondering if like I feel like because of the like the presence and everyone wants to see a face now like people don't want to read they want to see a video Mm -hmm. Um, because of that presence and because of social media I feel that people are more self aware of their image Mm -hmm. whether that's good or bad I just had a daughter so self image I'm like (laughs) I'm pumping confidence into her nonstop. but I think that has to deal with it Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also see a business aspect to it as a lot of people are starting health businesses or you see a lot of fitness people or fitness uh, businesses, startups or whatever. Uh, I guess I think you fall in that category. You do it. You're into fitness and health nutrition. Uh, I guess elaborate on that side of it. Like why do you do it and why are you passionate about health nutrition? And there's so many other things out there. What makes, what makes it different? Absolutely. I think there's a right and a wrong way to do it. Um, mm-hmm. A good example of that would be any sort of a, a shake diet out there or a very low calorie diet that's designed to get you fast results. Detox the the day. <laughs> even, even detox <laughs> um, But going down the road of those products, they were originally developed for a clinical situation, someone going in for surgery quite soon. So if you lose a lot of weight rapidly, you will decrease the size of your liver and your surgical risk will decrease substantially. And now they've morphed into the general population because someone has gone to the point going, okay, more is more. Losing weight quickly is a better thing. And while there's so many good elements to show, such as The Biggest Loser, 
yeah. around. Losing 10, 15, 20 kilos in a week, it's just not realistic. The body's not physically designed mm-hmm. to lose that amount of weight and lose that amount of fat mass. You're losing a lot of the things you don't want, as in your muscle mass. And once you do that, your metabolism takes an irreparable hit. At the end of the day, everything slows down and rebound weight gain. That's the yo-yo dieting cycle. You mm, know, yeah. it's it's a gradual, slow process. It's making sure things are balanced. It's making sure you got some physical activity in there as well. And that's where my job comes into it, really, to make sure that, that balance is there and, and to give a bit of a perspective as to what should be realistic. Absolutely. So what would you tell uh, someone that's coming in? They just finished a sport. They come to you saying, hey, I don't know what to do now. I'm gaining weight. What would you tell them? Let's get some balance. Let's have a look at what you're having to start with. And the biggest notion is going to be portion size at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, one simple thing and well, people get shocked at. I want to stop in there on portion size because I have heard theories of it's not so much of how much you eat, but what you eat. So mm-hmm. where where do you find the balance in that? Like, can you eat a lot of healthy? Because I know personally for myself, when I start eating, I guess you say, when I really get into eating healthy, I can have like a banana and an apple. I can have three bananas. I can have 20 bananas. <laughs> and it seems like in five minutes, like it, it hits me. I'm like, why am I like so hungry again? Or why am I like craving something bad when like I'm trying to be good? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And uh, different fuels do different purposes within the body. Some make you feel fuller for longer at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and like there's foods that are very rich in that energy or that petrol content. Yeah. And there's other foods that are, are really low in petrol content. And, and those are foods that I kind of deem as your free foods and, and more your vegetable based foods yep. that are higher in your vitamins and your minerals and your fiber. So you could load up on those types of foods and unless you had a couple of kilos of them at the end of the day, they're not going to add up to anything significant mm. that you have to worry about in terms of petrol content. Yeah. Mm. But things like your rice and your pasta, if you looked at rice for a serving size, a third of a cup is a serve. And if my fist being a full cup at the end of the day, a third, at the end of the day, if you go to any Thai restaurant, it'll <laughs> be- any Thai restaurant. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I get upset when they don't like fill up to the top. If I can see air in the uh, container, I'm like, um, mm. excuse me, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What's, okay. I'll say it's a lot better being here than Australia than in the States. In the States, like everything is massive. And I came here, I remember I was like, eating out with friends. I'm like, is, is that all? Is there another portion coming? <laughs> yeah. like, I'm waiting for more. And But my stomach started to shrink as I went along. And, and now it's, it's a little bit better. But even what you said, when I started really pay, paying attention to what I was putting in my body and actually weighing my food like it's kind of crazy to see what the proportions actually are that you're you're taking in and weighing it is it's, it's pretty full-on it's it, confronting and it I always is. encourage people I don't want people to weigh things on a daily basis but if you get that mm-hmm. visual and that eyeball straight away it's, uh, it's a shock factor it's an eye-opener. it really really is and, and to learn the value of what food is worth I think that's a message that doesn't get out there in terms of education in, in the schooling system to have that to manage like your body weight and, and body composition through life is a huge skill so this is a little bit not off topic but you just said you know manage your body do you embrace having scales or body scans and things mm, like that? Good question. Because, I mean, that's, it is a sensitive topic for some people. I know some people, because they worry about the scale so much, that it becomes toxic. Yeah. But to you, how can you do that in a healthy way that's not going to make you more depressed looking at it, but, I guess, energize? The number can be very uh, detrimental and you can get fixated on that number, especially with females, not to to typecast them at all as well. So if you don't see a shift in that number on the scales, then you'll get that depression and it can send you back into the old habits that you were in before. Whereas really, if you're looking at swapping your body composition around, getting more of that lean muscle mass, which is beneficial for your metabolism and and decreasing Mm -hmm. fat mass, you can actually change your shape, yet weigh the same. So... Mm -hmm. Seeing a number on the scales not change is not an indication of your success or failure. Look at that shape change. Look at how your clothes are fitting um, and, and look at the new composition in terms of and the technology of body composition analysis, those body scans, which can really break down what's mm. under the skin and, and detail that for you. Yeah. And that's where it should be at. And unfortunately, in the healthcare system, we're very much fixated on weight. I'm required in a clinical capacity to report to general practitioners with weight on a scale. Still to this point in time and and still to that point. So hopefully we can move forward from that. 
and uh, help the psychological side of it as much as possible. Oh, that's mm. good. Yeah, and speaking of body scams, shout out to Scammy Healthy. Yes. Great absolutely. guys. I have done that before, oh, and uh, it is confronting. Just did did you do one? I did. I wanted to do more. Uh, I, actually, like, I, I did it, and I had the sheet, and I was talking to a buddy of mine in the States, <laughs> and I could not find the sheet to save my life. I still don't know where it is to this day. I was so pumped. I was like, yeah, you know, uh, and there's this number... And uh, yeah, I didn't do it justice. So um, yeah, shout out to them. I definitely want to do another one. Yeah, thank appreciate you. that. Jace, thank you for that. Those are great nuggets. Guys, uh, make sure you're taking on. notes. Don't be afraid. Go back, rewind it, listen to what he has to say Absolutely. because he is an expert in his field and he's giving you guys things that are pl- applicable to you right now that you guys can use. Thanks for tuning in for this week's episode. If you like what you heard, subscribe to us on YouTube or iTunes. We want to hear your opinion on this week's topic. So let us know on our Twitter poll at grassroots underscore AU. Have you ever put down a sport for a period of time? Don't forget to check out our other social media platforms, grassroots underscore sports on Instagram and grassroots sports on Facebook. Head over to grassroots-sports.com.au and sign up to the Grassroots Sport newsletter for exclusive content and competitions. Enjoy your week, and we'll see you next time on the Grassroots Podcast.